So, in this presentation, we're going to speak a little bit about how to use Netflix uh, open source uh, software, uh, Kubernetes, and how to mix uh, those two concepts together in order to build the microservice based cloud platform. So my name is Dimitris, uh, I'm the founder and senior consultant of Harbor, where we basically give consulting services for, about using containers in development and production systems. I'm also the organizer of Docker Barcelona Meetup, and uh, recently I've become a member of the Docker Captains community. So, which one of you have been to a game of football club Barcelona? Raise the hands. So, I love you. Uh, basically, when you bought a ticket, probably you use the system that, uh, that from below it uses Kubernetes. So, one box is a ticketing distribution system, and it's one of our clients where basically we put uh, Kubernetes uh, in production in order to uh, resolve some problems that they had previously. And one of the biggest problems that we have is how can you handle peak traffic when you have, for example, a game of Football uh, Barcelona where basically you have a specific moment in time where you need to <coughs> handle a lot of people in order to buy tickets. Okay? So, uh, a simple infrastructure of uh, putting some armies in the Amazon and then replicating them is uh, not efficient and is not uh, cost effective. So, basically, we need to reevaluate the situation and make something a lot better. <coughs> And this is where containers come in the game. And what we're going to cover in this presentation is basically we're going to use Docker containers as deployment units. And we're going to use Kubernetes as an orchestration framework. Spring Cloud is going to be our uh, framework for microservices. Spring Cloud config is going to be our configuration management where we're going to, where we're going to put our configuration files. And Netflix or Reddit is going to be our service discovery so that the microservices can uh, identify the instances of the other services. And we're going to use Amazon AWS as our cloud provider and we're going to see how we can use different data, provider, data centers from the Amazon cloud in order to merge them all together in order to create a specific uh, cluster of Kubernetes and handle all the traffic. So the result of what I just talked about is a little bit more like this. This is, uh, we're going to see a proof of concept, let's say, or how we can build all this in, uh, infrastructure from uh, bottom to up. Okay, so the whole process. Uh, so here what we see is basically there are different uh, services, and we have the Eureka, which is our service discovery, and the config service, which are, is basically our configuration management. And all the microservices are going to ask them in order to find the instances, and find the configuration from the configuration server. And then we're going to discuss how we're going to come up to this kind of distributed infrastructure and how we're going to handle this. But first, let's start from the beginning. Okay, so why Docker containers? How many of you use already Docker containers in development or in production? Doesn't matter. So, a lot of people. So basically, you know more or less what are the benefits of containers. The benefits if you compare it with virtual machines basically is that they are a lot more lightweight, they reuse the same kernel, and uh, they are more isolated process. Okay, so basically what is it that we are resolving? Where everyone cared about uh, this thing worked in my machine, so I can I don't care about it, it doesn't work in production. So basically what we resolve with Docker containers is that the packaging system is, is a lot better. We have a packaging that it works in one machine, and if we take the same packaging and we put it in production, it will still work because it's the same exactly. So we don't have complicated configuration or distributing the system that may break the system. And the other thing is that we have is a parity between development quality and production environments. So this uh, the thing that mostly say, okay, it's not fine in development, so this is ops problem. So we basically uh, resolve the uh, isolation of different departments and we have a specific parity between all the environments. And the other thing that uh, Docker containers are enabling us is that we can share a programmable infrastructure. So basically, uh, we compare it with factories. Uh, we have a manual process where we have different people in one factory that they are doing a typical process. We take 
things and put it in another department and continue with that. And then we have a streamlined automation like in Tesla factory, for example, where one person can do the whole process and can go from up to down bottom uh, without any, any friction. And that resolves a lot of problems. Okay, so let's start with some, uh, some principles about, to, to, to talk about in order to, to explain a bit how we can con continue with that. First principle is, I don't know, if, how many of you have heard the pets versus cattle principle? Okay, some of you. Uh, basically the difference is that uh, pets is something that we give it a name. Uh, if it's something wrong with the pet, then we're going to give, put it to the doctor, see what's the problem take care of it and make sure that it will be okay. Instead, with the cattle, if there is a problem, maybe you give it an injection to see if it is not improves. If it doesn't improve, then you just buy another one and uh, you keep that one. Uh, so basically, this is the process that we're transforming also in the in the virtual machines and in the servers on the IP infrastructure. So basically, you don't have to name your IP infrastructure with specific names because uh, it should be something consumable, it should be something that you can have it in a very large scale and you don't, shouldn't care about one specific infrastructure. Uh, okay, so let's talk about immutable servers. What's the difference between a mutable server and an immutable server? A mutable server basically is something that whenever you want to upgrade something, you're going to go inside change the specific version that uh, if you have a version, a new version of an application then you're going to change that version in the, state, in the specific server and uh, if you have a new operating system you're going to get inside, upgrade the operating system, patch it, everything and that's basically a new the server. This is the traditional way of how we're doing the operations until now. In the new server basically says that don't change things inside your server meaning server, your packaging, your application, or your container. But basically, just drop that one, create a new instance, and forget about the previous one. What changes this is that uh, basically the responsibility of the server or container in that, in that scenario is that it's a lot more reduced. It doesn't care about how to upgrade itself. It doesn't care about what to create zero downtime upgrades. It doesn't care about anything. It's just something that is static. It has one application, runs that application with a specific operating system, and it doesn't change. So it reduces a lot the scope of what something does. And another concept which is very important is fault tolerant design, which means that whenever you have something, you should always design your system, first of all, to be distributed in order to have multiple instances and make, make sure that it is fault tolerant so that if something happens, then it shouldn't affect your system. Uh, a great example of fault tolerant system is basically an airplane that has four engines. If an engine fails, it should continue working without any problems. So your systems also should be doing the same thing. If something happens with a specific instance, the system should be resilient to that kind of failure and uh, it should uh, make sure that it doesn't affect the system, the overall system. Uh, the Herok guys made a very specific, a very, very nice uh, uh, concept which is called the 12 factor app which basically they describe the 12 concepts that uh, if you follow them basically you're going to have something that is uh, more to the microservice oriented uh, infrastructure. One of those uh, examples is basically the configuration that the configuration should not be inside your uh, application you should not bake it with your application but it should be something external and we are going to see the example of how we're going to do it now and there are 11 other concepts that uh, I would suggest you to, to read it out if you already don't, uh, because it's a very, very interesting uh, concept. Okay, so let's go to Kubernetes. Why Kubernetes? Basically, Kubernetes, how many of you have used already Kubernetes a little bit, even in development, testing, or production? Great hands. Okay, one question. Okay, so I will explain. Kubernetes is basically a platform, an open source platform for automating the deployment, scaling, and operations of application containers across clusters, of course, providing container-centric infrastructure. That's the definition of what container is. 
And what does it give? It gives portability. You can use basically the same Kubernetes. If you, if you describe something in Kubernetes language, then you can run it in the cloud, you can run it in Amazon, you can run it in Google Cloud, you can run it on-premise, everywhere. It's basically agnostic and this gives you the opportunity to decouple your own infrastructure and processes from your provider-specific uh, infrastructure. It is extensible, you can create modular and composable things, and it's basically self-healing. It describes, it, it has uh, the necessary uh, components in order to do auto-placement, auto-restart, replicate everything uh, if necessary, and auto-scale if, uh, if it's possible. So, uh, one of the important concepts between uh, in, in for Kubernetes is that it's, uh, it defines its it defines its infrastructure using declarative objects. It's not imperative, it's declarative. The difference between imperative and declarative is that imperative is something that when you give a command, you basically give an action, and when you declare something, basically you declare the desired state. And the difference between those two concepts is that in the imperative, you're going to be the one that you're going to act directly on the system, and in the other one, you're going to have an agent that will act for you. And having an agent that will act for you makes possible things like self-healing. So if you, desire, if you describe your desired state to be, I want to have three containers running for that specific application, if something happens to one of those, then the agent is going to make sure that you're going to have a new instance for that. So here we can see that the imperative example is that you can create five instances of Redis with Docker. And with Kubernetes, you can create five instances, five replicas of the Redis image, and basically you're going to describe to the agent that I want five instances, uh, five instances, and he will be uh, the one responsible for creating those. Uh, these are four things are basically the four concepts, the most higher level concepts of Kubernetes. Pod is basically. Uh, one or more containers under one specific uh, uh, IP. So basically, these are tightly coupled containers that they do not run uh, one without the other. Uh, so this way, you can describe an entire system that you say, okay, this the Tomcat and the Apache want, to, for example, to be running in the same machine always. So you can describe them as a pole. Replication controller basically is a, is an object that describes. Uh, the current state what, uh, describes how many instances of the pods you want. So basically, the replication controller, you can say, I want five replicas, and he will be the one responsible for creating <coughs> the five pods for you. Service is basically uh, a set of pods that you can group them together, and you can describe that these pods are going to uh, give me a specific service and you can create an endpoint uh, which is an IP and a port for that specific service. And labels are basically arbitrary metadata that you can put to all your objects uh, in order to group them together. And this is a very powerful mechanism in order to create your own patterns on top of it. So the architecture of Kubernetes basically there are three concepts, which is the API server, which everything that you do with the Kubernetes goes through the API server. And then there is the scheduler, which is the one responsible for scheduling your pods in specific machines that we share. Each machine that we share is called a node. And then there are the controllers that are monitoring your state and acting for your own behalf in case there is a change in the state and making sure that they are going to uh, keep that state uh, as your desired state uh, describes. So there are control loops in, uh, in order to achieve that, which is uh, observe, different, if, and act. So if there are differences between the desired and actual state, it will act in, in, in order to make sure that your system goes uh, to the desired state. And here we're going to see an example of how a live update of an application is done, okay, using the rolling, the rolling update process. And basically this is for example, if you have a version 1 of your own application and you want to go to the version 2, you don't want to have downtime, so you have to make sure that this thing goes somehow to keep the old versions during your update of the new version. So basically, during the, uh, the Rolling update, what happens is that you have a new replica controller, which is described here. This is the service that describes 
the right end port, which is exposed to the client, to the user. And when you have uh, the rolling update, basically will say, give me one instance from the new rolling update, uh, rolling uh, replicate controller version, which is the version 2. It will go down the replicas of the previous replica replication controller to two, two versions, two instances. We'll do two instances for the new version, one instance for the old one, three instances for the new version, and it will just stop the previous version. So basically, this is what the rolling update is. Now, there is another concept because right now what we saw is uh, how you can do rolling update from your machine the, uh, through the client uh, command line. You can launch a rolling update, but what happens if I close my laptop or if I lose the connection? Uh, how can we handle this from the server side, where this is where deployment objects come in, and basically this is where you describe your own deployment uh, new version. So basically in the deployment object you say I have a version 2, and from server side it's going to be responsible for handling all the changes in the replication controllers in order to handle the zero downtime feature. So, as a reminder, this is what we're going to have. Uh, to have. And so let's start. We have Spring Cloud, Netflix, Eureka. So Eureka basically is a Netflix open source project, which is for uh, <coughs> service discovery. So Eureka instances can be registered, and the clients can discover the instances using Spring-based uh, Spring managed things. Okay. So how can we create this uh, Eureka server? Well, basically, if you go to the Spring start spring.io you will just need to select the dependency of Eureka server which is here generate the project you can just put the name Eureka and when you go down, download the code the thing, only thing that you need to do is basically you can you need to say to the bootstrap properties what is your Eureka uh, URL which is Eureka uh, and the port basically we put by default 88 because that's the port that is being used for Spring. And the only thing that we need to do is basically enable a Eureka server. Put this annotation here in the code, and this is going to be sufficient in order to start the Eureka server. Okay, so how do we compile the project? We basically we use Maven. So if we do a Maven clean install, we are going to compile the project. And if we do a Java minus jar, the jar that we have generated is going to run, and we can see the result which is this basically, this is the dashboard of Eureka. Okay. okay, how are we going to dockerize that? Well, basically there is a, there is a Docker, uh, Docker file in the Docker Hub that if you do a bank mod, this is the user, but I just found the Docker file on the internet. I'm just using that as a Docker file for my project, and basically this Docker file explains that I, it will take the app jar which is the, the, the jar file that I have in my system, put it inside the container and then launch it. So I'm just going to copy my Eureka jar file named as app and when I build the project, I'm using Captain Build, but basically Captain is a tool in order to make so, uh, the Docker build minus T, all the necessary components in order to create your uh, Docker command. And basically, the output of the captain build is going to be an image which is called uh, Spidey. Spidey is my username. And the Eureka is basically the directory where I built this one. So this is going to be the name of the image. And when I'm going to run it and expose at the port 88, if I do a turn, I'm going to see the output of the Eureka. So this, if, you, if you do Eureka apps, the Eureka is going to respond to you what are the applications that have been registered in the Eureka. So how do I deploy this to Kubernetes? Basically, with one command, if you do a Kubernetes, kubectl, kubectl is basically the command line of Kubernetes. And if you do a run Eureka and you say your name of the image, then it's going to create a deployment object in your Kubernetes and it's going to deploy your image there. So if you do a get pods, you're going to see your pod running. And if how are you going to scale this? Well, basically, you can describe to Kubernetes how to scale the deployment 
and you just need to say that I need five replicas. And when you say that, and you see your bots, you're going to see that you have five bots running. Okay. okay, we now have the bots, but how are we going to expose them so that we can interact with them? So, in order to expose the bots and create a service for them, we're just going to use the command line from the kubectl, which is called expose. And we're going to expose the deployment Eureka to the port 88. So basically, if we go and see later the services that we have in the system, you're going to see that there is a service called Eureka with a specific cluster IP. Cluster IP is something internal inside your cluster. And there is a port 88 that is being exposed there. So if I do a kernel in that specific port, IP and port, I'm going to have a response to my Eureka. So, this is how Eureka seems now. And if you see below here, Eureka itself has been self registered in the Eureka system. And we can see now here five instances that have been, yeah, are being run. Okay, again, now what we're going to see is how are we going to do the configuration part. So, Spring Cloud config. Spring Cloud Config basically provides a server and slide site support for externalized configuration in a distributed system. Basically, it means that our configuration is not part inside of the application, but we're going to use a service that is external one and we're going to consume all the configuration from there. Okay, so how do we create? Again, we go to the start of Spring IO. We say, I want a config server and I want an Eureka Discovery. Eureka Discovery basically is a client for Eureka so that the config server self-registers inside the Eureka. And basically, again, we're going to sign out to the application properties that our configuration is going to be stored inside the Git repository, which is that specific URL, and we're passing that as a property in the config server. And then we say, enable config server as annotation and enable Eureka client so that we can activate the config server inside the project and we can activate the Eureka client inside the project. So again, we're going to do a main clean install, run it, test that it works, and if we do a kernel, then we're going to see the output of the configuration server. Based in the configuration server, you're going, you can ask him what <coughs> some uh, annotations. We are putting here a specific uh, system, which is the demo test, and this is the JSON that is, is giving us. So depending on what your application, you can put different context here, and it will resolve to different uh, contexts. So in our lab, we are going to use a mind message uh, annotation, which is called Hello World, and this is what we are going to consume later from a demo application. Again, we dockerize it using a specific Docker file, we copy the jar inside the specific name, we do a build, we run the container, we test it, and basically we can see here the profile is what we asked for. It. And how we deploy it? Again, we just do a kubectl run config, and we put the image name, and this is going to run. We do a get pods, and we see that there is one pod, then we scale it to five replicas, we do a get pods, we get five replicas of the configuration. And then we expose the service. Okay. So now we expose the service of the configuration. And if we get service, we're going to see that there is a specific IP for that configuration. If we ask for that IP, then we're going to get the specific profile that we want. Okay. So let's go to the microservices. <coughs> so basically, for the microservices, we're going to use Spring Boot. And Spring Boot basically is a Spring based application that you can just run. And on top of that, Spring Boot, there's Spring Cloud, which basically helps you to make distributed systems using configuration management, service discovery, SQL breakers, and other characteristics. So, again, we create a web, web application. We use a configuration client and then the Eureka Discovery so that we can config, uh, find all the configuration from the configuration server and register itself in the Eureka server. 
And this is our code. Basically, here we say this is a, a, an Eureka client. This has configuration. And basically, here we say our annotation that uh, this message is going to be replaced by uh, the annotation of my message that we have in the configuration server. And basically, in this, uh, in this code here, what it does, it will uh, print the host name of the machine so that we can see in which host name, in which host name is responding for us. And it will also give us the message. So in order to do this, we have to add in the bootstrap what's the name of the application, which we're going to call it demo, and which is the config URL, uh, URL which is config and the port is 88. The config is being resolved from a DNS server that is inside of Kubernetes so that it will resolve to the service that we defined before. And this way it will find the service of config and load balance it to one of the instances of the configuration. So, we just do an NPM install, we run the project, and we can see that it works locally. It will give me a hello world and it will give me my own machine, which is a Mac. But let's put it in a container. So, we put it again in a container, we build it, we run it as a container, and we see that the output of the host name is specific uh, random number, which is basically the uh, universal user, uh, UID of the container very much container instance. <coughs> and if we want to deploy it to Kubernetes, basically the same process as before. We run it as a demo, we put the name of the image, and we have a deployment. So if we do a get pod, we're going to see one instance. We scale it to five. We do a get pod, we'll see five instances. We expose the service, and if we do a curl of uh, the specific service, which is the demo service, we're going to see the specific message, the hello world, which is taken from the config server, putting it in the demo, and we're going to see that each instance is being uh, responding. Each time it's a different instance that is being responding because there is a load balancer which is done by the Kubernetes uh, service. So basically, this is what we have now. Okay. And. I wanted to show you before in, uh, in my machine what we had, but instead of using my machine because I had some problems with the DNS locally, I did the deployment on the cloud. So basically, I did that before the presentation. I will show it to you now. Uh, now I have the pods that we can see here. There are five pods. Can you see? Okay, let's see first the services. Now we have three services, which is one is the config, the demo, and the Eureka, as we spoke before. We have a cluster IP, which is a part of the internal cluster. Uh, but in order to access it, because we are now in the cloud, we don't have it locally, we have an external IP, which is basically load balanced by the uh, cloud provider. So I'm going to go to that IP. which was the config one, for example. And I'm going to say, I want the demo test. So you can see now that it's running, and it gives me, this is the, uh, uh, the property that we are going to consume from the demo. Okay. So here is the text. This text message comes from this Git repository. Which these are Git repositories, basically, this is the application YAML which describes all the infrastructure. Basically, here it says that this is the Eureka where you can find it. And the demo is basically the properties file that describes the, the properties. So, my message hello world, this from the config server is being uh, transformed to this, this text here. If I go to the Eureka server, we can see that we have one instance of the Eureka and we have three instances of the demo. And here we have one instance of the config. And if I go to the demo, which is this IP, you can see that <coughs> this changes during the time. Okay. So all of the instances of my pods that I have are being resolved under this IP and port. 
Okay, now let's for example scale the deployment config replicas file. So with this command, we can now see that there are new containers creating. This might take some time because this there are new machines in the server. But we're going to come back here. Let's see. No. Any questions until now? Okay, so basically this this is taking some time because there are four nodes in the cloud and basically they are now downloading the containers. As I said before, this I did before. Okay. So we have now running the containers. And if I do a log of this specific container, we're going to see that it's starting. Okay. So whenever it finishes starting, we're going to see that it's going to be registered in the Eureka. <coughs> okay, it started. And now we can see that we have five instances of the So basically we have this kind of infrastructure right now running and if uh, we want to go to a multi data center then we just need to con connect different data centers instances of the servers and they are going to connect to that specific cluster. The benefits of using the Eureka with uh, service discovery is basically that uh, the load balancing is done client side instead of server side. And this means that the applications uh, of the Spring know all about the instances and they know also the location of those instances. And if there is a location that is near your instance, then they are going to choose that one, which makes a lot better for the performance, instead of using something that is uh, completely transparent for the application. Okay, so basically in Harbo, what we do is we modernize this kind of uh, workflows uh, and we use containers as first class citizens. We put containers, Docker containers, for one and a half years running in production now. And the service that we're doing is basically consulting and training. We're also partners of Google in the cloud platform. And uh, these are some of our use cases that we're, we work with. In the tourism sector, sector, we have an infrastructure that's running uh, 20, uh, 22 million hits uh, daily. Uh, one box is, which is the uh, use case that we saw today, more or less, is that the, the objective is to have a 30% cost reduction in the Amazon servers, which is basically one very good objective. And then I plan that we have is using cloud native infrastructure, which basically means using Kubernetes, they can deploy their own product in, in different cloud providers. And we basically use also, we open source our uh, own tools in order to do things, and we like to uh, give back to the community. And basically that's it. Do you have any questions? Yes. When you scale the Eureka, when? If you scale the, the Eureka with Kubernetes, you need to pass the, the URL of all the Eureka. I didn't, can you repeat the question? If you want to replication the Eureka server, yes. can you pass the all URLs of all replicas? No, I just need to pass it the, the specific uh, service. But you pass the service, the replication is, is by truth. Is by truth or in inundation. Basically, if I want, for example, here we can do a scale of the deployment of the Eureka. And basically, it will use the specific service that is the Eureka service, which gives the IP port and it will ask for it the rest of the Eurekas. And they will also connect with, uh, with the other side, the clients using client side uh, load balancing. So basically, we are going to to find it themselves. 
and this will create replicas of the uh, legacy service. Does this answer the question? Yes, but they are going to find the other instances because uh, basically when they respond that uh, when someone connects to the Eureka service, the other service uh, are going to say this is my IP and this is my port, so basically they are going to connect directly instead of using the service, the, the service and the IP port connection. No. <coughs> Any other questions? Is there any other benefits of using the Eureka instead of the integrated ECD, ECD in uh, Kubernetes, except the client side uh, discovery? Well, basically, the, uh, the objective of using uh, Eureka with, instead of using Kubernetes or any other uh, server discovery is because uh, this is part of the application infrastructure. Basically, this is part of the Spring framework and the Spring. Uh, uh, stack of what the client uses. So basically, instead of disrupting that and saying, don't worry, you don't have that responsibility, that's part of the Kubernetes stack, you say, okay, keep your stack uh, uh, the same way it is, and we're going to just do the rest of the orchestration, and we're not going to touch that part because it depends. That part you can say it's part of the infrastructure, or you can say it's part of the application stack. Yeah, but you still have a two discrete uh, discovery mechanisms. One which is for Kubernetes, which is internally using ETCD, and the second for the application, which is the Eureka. So it's a little bit overkill. If there yeah, is no case that you use the client side. Um, well, basically, Kubernetes itself is going to continue using the ETCD for service discovery and for its own storage yeah. database. Uh, that different responsibilities. Uh, so you don't, even even if you uh, you were using uh, service discovery of Kubernetes, you you would never use your application to connect to the ECD server of the Kubernetes because that would uh, disrupt security problems and create security problems because it should, the application should not have direct access to the ECD cluster of Kubernetes. That's uh, Backend implementation uh, specific of Kubernetes itself. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much.